Welcome back. Here's Consuelo reading chapter two. Chapter two, The Riddle, one year later. Wars, people disappearing, climate going crazy. A year ago, I would have told you my life's goal was to become a less selfish person. Every adult in my life, dad, mom, nana, school said so. And I tried, really tried. But I found out it's a lie, a big lie. Nice stuff you tell little kids, and selfish gets you nothing but squashed down like a bug. Truth is, life is about survival. Making sure you do the squashing instead of the other way around. Some people say I'm obsessed with martial arts. Me, I say I'm focused. It's scary out there. I gotta be prepared for anything. Last night I dreamed dad was in trouble. He was in this really dark place and he looked a lot older, a lot. He was talking, but I couldn't hear him. I kept asking him to talk louder. I thought he was telling me to get him out of the dark place. It's never happened before. The dream, I mean. I stripped off my judoki, threw on my jeans and t-shirt and sweatshirt, tied my sneakers, packed my bag, and rushed out of the dojo. I had to hurry because Mom was taking me to Nana's. I always liked going to Nana's, especially since Dad vanished. I liked talking about him, and I liked the animals. And I had to find out if it was me that made Dad disappear. I know a lot of kids feel it's their fault when a parent leaves, but in my case, it's true. I wish something and then it happens. Like my wishes have power or something. I braked when instead of our Ford Escort, mom was sitting with CQ at the far end of the parking lot where nobody could possibly scratch his precious red BMW convertible. Why was mom bringing him to Nana's? Then I remembered she had an impromptu meeting called at Fermi Lab and Conrad, her boss, probably offered to take us. My best friend, Shango, border collie supremo, sat in the back seat, his head and front legs hanging out into the Illinois summer air. He looked like a prisoner just before the moment of release. I was about 30 feet away, took my phone out of my po front pocket sweatshirt and snapped a picture of him. He jumped out, dashed across the hot asphalt, mouth open, tongue hanging out, crazily running toward me. I knelt and spread my arms and he was all over me. Giant glad dog slobbers. I hugged him, scratched his back and kissed his face. Enough with the reunion, oh so slow Esperanza, said CQ. He said it like he was making a joke, but I heard the irritation in his voice and continued rough housing Shango. He looked like he was inching to hunk, Conrad I mean, but didn't because mom was there. I continued playing with Shango. So what is it today? I can't keep it all straight. Tuesday, Thursday, karate, Friday's Tai Chi, and uh, today's Saturday, so it must be judo, right? His voice was higher and stretched. I continued playing with Shango. You forgot Monday, Wednesday, hop keto. Conrad thought his humor hid that he hated me. Wrong as usual, C-Cube. We gotta get going, pumpkin, Conrad yelled. I hated it when he pretended to like me by calling me icky sticky names. That was all for mom's benefit. I raced Shango to the car and he leaped over the side into the back seat. I grabbed the edge of the back door and flipped myself over onto the back seat next to Shango. Nice red car. Conrad swung around squinty eyed. That dog better not have scratched that seat. I bent my head low like a detective holding a pretend magnifying glass. Ooh, it's a really teeny weeny scratch. I have this great polish. You won't even notice it. C-Cube looked like he was close to blowing a gasket. 
Mom turned around and frowned. She's kidding. Dog's been groomed, nails clipped. I'd never let anything happen to this beautiful car, I said. The gasket was on the edge. How many times do I have to tell you? It's vermilion, not red. His voice was more real, less controlled than before. Good, let mom see how you really feel about me. Shango panted and drooled on the sacred leather. CQ swung around and jammed his elbow over the top of the driver's seat. See what I mean? That's exactly why I didn't want that mutt. Oops, gasket blown. I scrunched over and, with the edge of my shirt, wiped the seat. Please don't call me a mutt, Conrad. We can't all be purebreds like Shango. CQ looked at Mom, who covered her mouth and pretended a coughing fit to hide a laugh. Enough, you two. She grabbed my backpack and from near her feet and swung around in her seat and handed it to me. You got all your school stuff plus a few extra surprises. I took the backpack, unzipped it, hoping to find my manga comics along with my school books. Good. Two new comics I hadn't read yet. Thanks, Mom. The Gandhi book was there, too. I shivered. The last time I saw that book was in our family room. I was texting my friends, and Dad was sitting and reading it in, in an armchair. He said I should read it, that it had changed his life. And what did I say? Gandhi is so middle grade. I yanked the Gandhi book out and opened it and read a quotation on the roots of violence. Wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character. A yellow paper dropped from the book and fell on my lap. I picked it up, read it, and sucked in a cup, a ton of O2. I'd recognize Dad's writing anywhere. The message in the note was so Dad. It was a riddle. Dad was always doing that, putting little riddles around the house for me to figure out. How did it get there? It wasn't there before. Mom must have put it there. It read, truth, beauty, and goodness are equal in rank and distinction, eschewing all masters. But should a competition ensue, two are the servants of the one, avoiding disaster. My throat swelled. I missed him, really missed him. It had to be a clue, a clue to his disappearance. Or maybe it was false hope. I stuffed the note in my back jeans pocket. No one spoke during the half hour drive and that was cool because all I could think about was the note, Nana's attic and the night dad disappeared. Even after the police gave up, Mom hired a private detective, but he didn't find anything. Then they stopped looking, and no one spoke about it anymore. Conrad grumbled and started the car, his freckled neck and straw-dry hair staring right at me. The vermilion, not red BMW rolled up in front of Nana's stone cottage, where overgrown shrubs and wildflowers crawled over everything, except for a narrow path that led to the porch. I inhaled the smell of lilac from a bush in the corner. Nana's house breathes life. Conrad nodded. Yup, a real tropical jungle, germs and all. Doubt it meets the minimum sanitation requirements. A raccoon ran down the steps to Conrad's side of the car, stood up on its hind legs and sniffed. Conrad turned to mom with an, I'm gonna be sick look on his face. And mom patted his arm and turned to the raccoon. Get out of here, Ned. Not everybody likes a nosy raccoon. She turned back to Conrad. Oh, come on now. It's not that bad. Hey, I'm a major germaphobe, but I hoped it was that bad. I hope the raccoon hopped right into the vermilion, not red convertible. I hope the coon gave him a big sloppy coon kiss. With luck, the coon had rabies. 
Don't worry, Nana has a ton of extra strength raid. Shango jumped out and I started over the side. CQ yelled, use the door. About three seconds later it came, please, for mom's benefit, of course. But I pretended not to hear in time and kept going over the side. I ran toward Nana and yelled back at CQ, hardly scratched it at all. Nana was wearing a huge grin and carrying an armful of roots and herbs when she let out her cringe-inducing cry. But I didn't cringe. I used to, but not anymore. Now I see it as a part of her charm. Hey, who else has a grandmother who screams like a banshee every time she sees you? Shango and I rushed to meet her. She was hurrying so fast she stumbled and managed not to fall, but the herbs and roots flew everywhere. When she got her balance, she reached up and adjusted her gray woolen cap, which she'd worn for as long as I can remember. She wiped her hands on her skirt and wrapped her arms around me. Nana's hugs always made me feel good. Then Nana, Mom, and I collected the roots and herbs with CQ watching, like he was studying the scene, seeing how he could play it like a killer whale studying baby seals on a beach. Nana stacked the roots and herbs beside the porch, looked at Sea Cube and shook her head like she'd forgotten something. I was gonna make a black male pie for you all, but I left the berries by the lake. I turned to Conrad. Nana's black male pies are to die for. Esperanza, could you fetch them for me? I'll make it later for you and me. On the pier, right? She tugged at the edges of her cap and winked at me. You got it, sweetie. Me and Shango ran to the lake, which was about a 45 minute run from her cottage. That's where I used to fish and swim with dad, where I found Shango. I wondered what Nana planned to tell mom and Conrad that she didn't want me to hear. Thank you, Consuelo. Please join us next time when she will read from chapter three. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me. You can also visit my website, lorainesegel.com.